Classes in Wargame Design, a series of lectures based on George Philly's book, Designing Board Wargames, Introduction, to be available from Smashwords.com and Amazon Kindle. And today, Lecture 17, Panzer Blitz, Part 3. So what we're going to do today is to finish off our discussion of the Panzer Blitz rules Panzer Blitz supplies an example of a tactical game. Now, on one hand, it's modern weaponry and it's respectably large units. Individual unit counters are typically a group of vehicles or 30 to 50 men. However, the basic ideas, um, ranged weapons, close combat weapons, (coughs) line of sight, spotting, the sort of issues that come up would continue to apply if the battle were scaled down to something much smaller. In fact, if you were to scale it all the way down to this is a board game that happens to resemble Dungeons and Dragons or Champions or some such other role-playing game, uh, the basic issues in terms of movement and combat don't change. The, you have to retheme the rules in an appropriate way, but the issues that you have weapons that act at a distance, what people that move, people that cl- have to close on each other to fight, those sorts of issues are not changed. <clears throat> Having said this, uh, we, be- we began last time to discuss the Panzer Blitz rules, and we got as far as discussing the notion of line of sight. The point of line of sight was that you, for most of these weapons, their direct fire, you actually have to see what you're shooting at before you can hit it. Uh, Panzer Blitz did have optional rules for indirect fire, which is actually appropriate in period. That is, we have some artillery pieces parked out on the West Street stub. Uh, we have some miscreant parked, oh, a couple miles north of here, and since we have radio contact, we can drop artillery shells in about the right location, and after a bit, drop them directly on the other fellow's head, even though you cannot see from here to there, because there are vast numbers of buildings and perhaps a hill in the way. Um, indirect fire weapons can be traced back rather long times. Of course, there were various siege instruments that were used even in ancient times. The um, usual one people think of, the trebuchet, big rock, lever arm, balance point, stuff being thrown, that's actually a medieval weapon. It's more effective than anything the Romans had. Um, Cannon fire, at least at first, was all direct fire, though there was an amusing case where uh, this goes back roughly to the period of the Battle of Bicocca. There were cannon on one hilltop. There was a ridge line. Uh, People fired over the ridge line at the target, which was a distance off, and there were several rather brave volunteers who stood on the second ridge line, noting where the cannon shells landed, and then walked out, picked up large potted plants, and moved them left and right to indicate where the fire should be directed to, redirected. Now, this is period cannon, so the rate of fire was extremely low, and walking out did not really mean a large risk of being shelled by your own people if the shell landed went in a little low. It worked. I I am assured it actually worked. I would not have cared to be the people trying to pull this one off. Okay, so let us consider where we go in Panzer Blitz. The first issue, uh, if we go back to the unit counters, was that Panzer Blitz groups units by type. And so there is what is loosely labeled infantry, which actually includes cavalry. There is armor. There are weapons that fire high explosive shells. There are mortars. These tend to be grouped together. Uh, There are things that function as carriers, potentially only of infantry. And then there are command posts whose function appears if you add the indirect fire rules. Uh, Each of these types is equipped with different weapons. Now, in the period in question, 
Um, infantry, if it wished to deal with tanks, basically had to walk up to the tanks and stick what are called satchel charges into the tread or do other adventurous things. The, some modestly later during the war, you get uh, handheld rocket weapons of very limited range that had shaped charge warheads. Uh, the point of a shaped charge warhead, this was discovered by an American cavalry officer after the Civil War. You have explosive, and you knock a dent in the explosive, and when you detonate the explosive, there's a pressure wave coming this way, there is a pressure wave coming that way, and if you have formed this shape fairly carefully, the transverse momentum cancels, uh, so there is a region of high pressure, and it goes out that way fairly impressively. Under modern conditions, you line this with a hollow copper plate. Some people will use other designs, that's an example. And you get a jet of incandescent metal being fired into the target. Um, uh, there was a great deal of screaming and raving when some of these were, appeared in Iraq, and the claim was that the Iranians were supplying these as if brass casting and machining hadn't been known in this part of the world for several thousand years. In um, any event, these show up later in the war in fair part. Now, the interesting bit is, well, we're shooting at things, and so each of these have characteristic weapons associated with them. That's sort of how they got dumped into their different classes. And in addition to having characteristic weapons, they have targets. And there are basically three targets. There is armor at less than one half range. There is armor at greater than one half range. And there is everything else. This is actually a real approximation. You don't have to be this approximate. There was an old Avalon Hill game, Tobruk. less than lovingly referred to by some people as buckets of dice, which truly refined, based on firing tables, absolutely everything. So there was a, do we hit the target? Where do we hit the target? What is the likelihood of penetrating the target and making a hole in it so we damage the stuff inside the armor, if it's an armored target? If we f get off several shots during the game period, however many seconds of turn we have. We roll separately for each one. Um, this is very close to miniatures rules. Miniatures rules, incidentally, adopt a very quaint convention, which we do not see here. And the quaint convention is called penetration. And the notion is you are firing an artillery shell uh, or an anti-tank round, and it will penetrate a certain number of millimeters of armor. If the armor is thicker than that, it, your round bounces off. If the armor is thinner than that, you make a hole and damage what's inside. Now, the pro pro basic problem with this concept, which does not get discussed in any game rules, is that manufacturing precision, by the time we're discussing this, is actually rather limited. And on one occasion, I was able to discuss with someone who was doing modern manufacturing what sort of precision you actually got in these penetration numbers and fusing numbers and such and not. And the answer was, it, on a good day, it was within a factor of two. And so um, something that would allegedly penetrate 100 millimeters of armor might bounce at 50, or it might penetrate up to maybe 200. And this was simply a matter that the reproducibility of chemical high explosives, which have to be poured, or if we go back to earlier period, it's gunpowder. If it's milled powder, where you've made the gunpowder, um, soaked it in something, and then crushed it to, say, the fineness of corn, you were better off. If you didn't know about milling, you had loose powder, which was intermixed grains of um, very fine of charcoal and niter and um, sulfur, uh, which had several quaint properties, including as it, you walk along, it separates 
so your mixtures aren't the same. It's a very fine powder. It leaks out of its containers and will occasionally detonate in midair spontaneously, taking the barrel of gunpowder with it. Um, in any event, if you go back further, the variation is even worse. Indeed, there is a manual on siege warfare, French, sort of 17th century, and here is the city wall, very schematic, you're shooting at, and here are the cannons shooting at the city wall, and the author draws something like this and estimates, that's roughly where the cannon balls will go, but if you fire enough in the right general direction, you will eventually make a hole in the wall. Well, coming back to this, we, the, the approximations are very simple. And there are only three sorts of targets. And um, th we now hit some constraints and effects. And the first is that if your armor firing at other armor at close range, the combat effect is doubled. Now, that's relative to the number you happen to have assigned as the base value. If the arm, if the armor is further out than half range, it's times one. And if the armor is firing at anything else like infantry, mortar crews that may have cheated and dug in a bit, all these other interesting things, the ar effectiveness of armor is times a half. Now, obviously this is a very approximate statement. It's being applied uniformly to anything that resembles a tank. And which might have ver some of which had very different guns than others did. But the net result is there's some notion that it, at close range, things are more effective. At further range, things are less effective. At extreme range, things are, against of soft targets, things are not effective at all. On the other hand, infantry firing at um, our armor is times zero. It did not have effective weapons. Um, high explosive weapons firing at armor at long range were approximately times one half. That's what's assigned. Um, and then we get down to carrier weapon, carrier vehicles. Trucks are typically unarmed. Well, let me qualify that. Trucks are unarmed except in the American army, which was lavishly supplied. And the duty of every squad sergeant and platoon, platoon leaders was to grab anything they could get their hands on, so that particularly later in World War II, American infantry tended to go into battle with considerably more firepower than their nominal table of organization and equipment would have suggested. Um, apart, the, um, Infantry squad in France that somehow had made off with a tank is perhaps an extreme case. They also had someone who could keep it in good repair. But they had made off with their equipment. Um, so we have these variations. <coughs> and the variations, of course, are somewhat precise and somewhat to add color and chrome. If you consider Stalingrad, you didn't see anything like this. In Stalingrad, everything had an attack factor, everything had a defense factor. Um, it didn't matter what you were attacking, your attack factor was the same. The defense factor might benefit from terrain. We haven't gotten to terrain yet. But the defense factor was of a 7104 is always 10. Um, here, if we look at 1914, there was a little variation because period European cavalry was, well, Mark Twain discusses a tour of, uh, I believe it's Yellowstone Park, uh, with an army group. And he goes through, I think it was Yellowstone, and they had a British cavalry officer with him. And the British cavalry officer explained that there was a fine solution to um, ranged weapons, which the English army had adopted, and the fine solution was the lance. Uh, and the Americans, who included a number of cavalry people who'd fought in the American Civil War, concluded that the British were going to get an education the next time they got involved in a war. Uh, that turned out to be totally correct. Um, in any event, we have this chrome, 
for weapons effects, if you were down to the individual scale, <coughs> the weapons effects could be much more detailed. If you wanted to do superhero combat, that doesn't get done very much for all that there are vast numbers of superhero comic books. And in recent years, at least modest numbers of superhero um, motion pictures, people who can bench press 18-wheel trucks, fly, um, have the mystic ability to detect chocolate at a distance, all of these neat superpowers. Um, there are very few board war games on um, this sort of thing. Part of it is that there are not a lot of board war games which go down to the individual character scale. I mean, in principle, you could say, well, we have role-playing games like Dungeons and Dragons. And soon thereafter, there were text-based adventures which vaguely resembled D&D, except you couldn't see the dice. And these have gotten much more impressive. But if you try to find board war games that do this, you will be... It's not impossible, but if you're looking for a lot of things, you will be somewhat disappointed. Um, in any event, we have all of these variations, but on the other side, we also have terrain. And to discuss terrain, uh, I have to point out that there's several, suppose we have terrain that is, favors the defender for one reason or another. There are at least three different sorts of ways in terms of the Panzer Blitz rules that you could imagine representing it. Uh, for example, you could say, oh, the attack factor is cut in half. If I am defending in favorable conditions, the weapon's effect goes down. Um, in terms of G, uh, Stalingrad, we instead say the defense factor is doubled, but the effect is approximately the same. Nonetheless, one choice is the at attack factor is cut in half. It doesn't have to be a half. It could be a third or a fifth or some other number. Um, but the net result is that the fire is just less effective. Your second choice is what is called die roll modifiers. And this, is, this, like the change in the combat factors, is a completely um, general mechanism. And the notion of the die roll modifiers, we have a combat results table. We identify the correct column on the combat results table, and then we roll die to see which line on that column we are going to use. Well, it's very nice to say we can choose this. However, we now, if we do the right thing, we can now um, arrange things so that some results become more likely. In order to do that, you have to say, we have a die roll modifier, which would be plus or minus some usually small integer. And that is applied to the die roll. To We have the raw die roll generated by rolling a die. And we now add or subtract a number as a mechanism to represent a modification in the outcomes. Now, if you think of the Stalingrad combat results table, this is a little odd, because the St in the Stalingrad combat results table, the um, results are sort of in random order. If you're going to use a die roll modifier, what you have to do is to reach in and reorder the combat results. And so you might say we have defender eliminated, defender back to, exchange, attacker back to, attacker eliminated. And if you arrange things so that the results appear in uniform order, then it makes sense to add or subtract a number. For example, if you say something is more favorable to the attacker, you would say, we will subtract, there are going to be two ALIMs in this column. We will add, subtract one from the die roll. And now a roll of six becomes a five, a roll of five becomes a four, a roll of two becomes a one, and you notice that at least some of the time there is a change in the utility of the result because of the die roll modifier. Now if you're going to do this, uh, one thing you can do is to take advantage of the fact change over the last oh, 50 years, 
that dice with funny numbers of sides are much more available than they used to be. And so if we go back uh, 40 or 45 years, a die, what we would now call a d20, labeled 0 to 9 twice, something that will give you a roll of 0 to 9, uh, you could get those imported from Japan for, in current dollars, several hundred dollars. Japanese Standards Association made them as random number generators in case you were doing Monte Carlo simulations. This is pre-computer. Under modern conditions, if you want dice with strange number of sides, you walk into almost any comic book store in the country and there will be heaps of them. You may not quite be able to find the Zachihedron which is a true D100. But you can find all sorts of other things. Um, th there are some practical limits if you decide you want to manufacture your own. I mean, with 3D printing, in principle, it's straightforward. The first difficulty is that if you're making dice, the density really has to be extremely uniform. And the second issue is the precision which, with which the sides are machined, so to speak, the demands on that machining is really extremely high. So you might make a mold, a shape that could be turned into a lost wax mold, and then you have to machine it to polish things up. But if you try to make a die with a peculiar number of sides, life can become interesting. Though for a small number of sides, there's something very easy cylindrical symmetry, polished sides, and as long as you have all of them the same, it gets easy. In any event, uh, the point I was tending to here in terms of die roll modifiers is that it gets much more interesting if you have more possible results. Uh, you do, have, however, have to remember that if you're going to say there's a die roll modifier, um, <clears throat> you have to allow for the fact that I have rolled a natural one and now have a shift, a die roll modifier of minus one. And there are any number of possible ways to fix this. One is to say that the system saturates and you pile up at the two ends. Panzer Blitz has a different solution. The combat results table allows for die rolls of zero and negative one. Now, of course, you can't actually roll a negative one on normal dice, but with die roll modifiers, you can get there, and the authors worked through, made sure they had all the possibilities covered, and there's die roll modifier. Another mechanism you could install is called the column shift. And the notion of the column shift is that, for example, we are attacking and we are doing something that is particularly favorable. And because we are doing something that is particularly favorable, the combat odds may compute to be 2 to 1, but we have a column shift of plus 2, and therefore it's rolled on the 4 to 1 column. So we have all of these modifiers that can be inserted. Oh, there's one more that could be inserted, which is type modification. The specific rule is that if we have infantry, and it is defending inside a town, it defends as armor, <coughs> which means that infantry type weapons are ineffective against it at range. These tend to be quite heavy buildings. It means that high explosive at long range is cut in half. On the other hand, if you are facing enemy tanks, you have the embarrassment that if they're, reason, if they're, if they're um, reasonably close, instead of being cut in half, because armor attacking everything else is cut in half, they're at half range against you, your armor class, and suddenly they're doubled instead of halved. And this reflects, uh, if you shoot stuff into towns, the parts of buildings tend to sail in all directions, causing all sorts of unpleasant results. This was much more dramatic if someone is going to, if you're going to do a game on Napoleonic period sail warfare, the cannonball would sail through. You know, a cannonball is this big, sort of, and it makes a hole, and it keeps on going. 
And you might ask, say, well, unless you're standing right in front of it, it may go by you fairly quickly, but it's harmless. The problem is it goes into the hull of the ship, which is made of wood. It comes out the hull of the ship, which is made of wood. <coughs> and when you drive an object through wood quickly, you get splinters. And I do not mean teeny tiny splinters you take out with tweezers. I mean splinters that may be three or five feet long that will impale people a distance to each side with lethal effect. So you have all of these changes. Um, I've mentioned the town change. Uh, for units defending on s slopes and tops of hills, fire, people firing up, you get a times two benefit. The times two benefit reflects the fact, let me draw a picture. Here's a hill. And here are people shooting up. And if someone is sort of here and the ground is bit, a bit irregular, the irregularity in the ground is extremely nice about giving you cover. Ditto, if you are kind of up here, the irregularity of the ground plus the fact there's an angle to the fire, you tend to get an advantage. And if the people are firing, for example, like this, they are likely to miss. Uh, in some periods, you have the further advantage that the people, not World War II so much, that the people down here shooting at you probably were not trained in firing at targets that were anything other than level. And even at that, there was very little training. Indeed, you can find period disputes, French army officers, if we are shooting at people downhill from us, should we instruct the um, people to aim, to point their weapons up a bit or down a bit relative to what they expected? And there is no, and it does not seem to occur to anyone to march a company out and fire a bunch of rounds and find out what the answer was. Um, now, if you are on a slope and the other guy is on a slope, it tends to cancel out unless there are irregularities in the ground pointing sideways. We're now looking at the slope from above. And if there's sort of a bulge in the hill outward, people here have some cover from there. Uh, if you're on a hilltop, things are flat. There is an interesting, this does not show up in Panzerblitz, the though the ground scale is such that it could have. There is a distinction between the crest of the, the top of the hill, the crest, and the military crest, which is sort of over here. And the distinction is that if you're at the military crest and you are shooting down the slope, you can see the bottom of the slope and shoot at people down there. If you are at the two crest, your line of fire is blocked and people in here are in the shadow of the hill and are safe from fire. Uh, there is a famous example of this with um, dramatic political effects. We go back to the Spanish-American War. The Spanish army had been building observation to towers as high as possible on the hill to see large distances. These weren't local defensive positions. These are, we would like to see what is coming a distance out. Teddy Roosevelt and his Rough Riders charged one of these, which by the way doesn't work very well. And Roosevelt had the advantage, or rather his neck was saved, because the Spanish had not built here, they built up there. If they built here, his unit charging up the hill would assuredly have been wiped out. And we would have had a different president. Uh, as it was, um, they got part way up and then ran into problems and had to be rescued by American infantry. Um, but that's the difference between crest and military crest. There are reasons for defending on each one, but they aren't the same. Well, there are multiple other terrain modifiers, but we should push ahead to discuss movement. Uh, Panzerblitz, you may recall, has the play sequence. First you have fire combat, then you have move. This is the reverse of Stalingrad. 
There are very good reasons for using move then attack um, in Stalingrad, namely that if you do the reverse, someone actually did this once, <coughs> uh, you shoot, now you move your units next to the enemy, and if the enemy does not wish to take losses, she displaces her units back a square, and when it is your combat turn again, you are no longer next to the enemy and cannot attack. And so you are limited to moving ahead one square a turn, never causing any losses. Of course, the enemy has the same problem. You can't have everything. Um, so, Panzerblitz, though, has the feature that there are two types of combat that occur during the movement section of the turn. And one is described as overrun. And the other, which happens at the very end of the turn, is described as close assault. Uh, in overrun, we have a unit parked here in the open. And if we have, for example, a group of tanks, we execute what is called an overrun attack. That is, we move here. We move on top of the enemy unit. We aren't allowed to stop there. And we move off the far side and come to a halt. And this is, uh, we are going to deal with these people by running them into the ground. Now, you're allowed to do this by coming in from several different directions. And when you've set up all of the directions where you're making the overrun, you calculate things. Uh, overrun was viewed as being fairly devastating, so you get die roll modifiers, you get column shifts, there are various sorts of things you can get. The units that have done this have to stop, but you have now, if you're reasonably lucky, cleared this unit out of the way and other people can just sail through. Uh, this rule is sort of like the Africa Corps automatic victory rule. Uh, the Africa Corps automatic victory rule, if I attack a delaying unit, just as in Stalingrad, at 7 to 1 or higher, not only is the unit always going to die, but its zone of control and presence instantly shuts off, and other people can pour through the hole into the enemy rear. <clears throat> if you add automatic victory to Stalingrad, gameplay becomes very different put it mildly. Uh, and I, it, it, it's, this is one of these things people proposed, and then they had some people who were competent tacticians demonstrate how devastating it was and what you could do about it, and that sort of approach went away. Uh, the notion in overrun, though, is that <clears throat> if you are going after people, it, this simulates something that actually happens. That is, we have the um, border and we have a couple of guys with pistols who are supposed to be the customs guards, and here comes the invading tank column. Well, they don't really have to stop for an hour and fight a battle. Um, <clears throat> the other piece is close assault, and the notion of close assault is that <clears throat> after you've done fire combat, <clears throat> if you have your infantry immediately next to a target, after everything else is done, you can execute a close assault attack and attack whatever is sitting there. And this is actually the only way infantry is allowed to damage armor. The, there's another issue that is a little more subtle with close assault and with um, overrun, and it has to do with the way uh, the combat results table is arranged. That is, if you look at the combat results table to Panzerblitz, there are three combat results. D, dispersed, DD, double dispersed, and eliminated. <coughs> it is fairly difficult to get an eliminated. Dispersed means the un you turn the unit counter upside down. It can't move or shoot during the owning player's turn. It, however, at the end of the turn, it's flipped back up and is back to normal. Well, that's fine, but that says you, if you are just getting these results, you are basically playing whack-a-mole. And you whack one down, and the other pops up, and you just keep doing this. 
And since you can only attack a unit once a turn, you've got an issue. Now, we do have the result DD double dispersed. So if you have a unit that is already dispersed, it's eliminated. But you're only allowed fire combat on a target once a turn. <coughs> How are you going to get benefit out of the DD? And the answer is you attack it conventionally. There are a couple alternatives that are a little rarer. And disperse it. And now you execute close assault against it while it's not very effective. And you get benefits. A, you get a die roll modifier favorable to the attacker if you attack a dispersed unit. And B, the close assault has its own favorable changes. And you can actually start inflicting casualties. Um, Close assault has the interesting rule that you cannot execute a close assault after using road movement. Because you'd be in column and as opposed to the formation you'd need. And since the turns are only six minutes long, actually getting something, a platoon, from road march into position to attack in only six minutes is pretty good, even if it's well trained. Uh, so how do we... Uh, do this well. We remember to insert a rule. If you are marching along a road, you do not have to use road movement. Uh, road movement is one half of a movement point per square. Regular movement is one. And that brings us back to mo movement, most of which is how many movement points it takes to execute a move. But there is one cute bit. Here is a swamp. Here's another swamp. There's a road. And I have something parked on the road. And here comes a tank unit. Well, the presumption is the um, unit that is standing there is already on the road blocking it. And on a six minute time scale, you have to do a minuet or maybe a square dance to exchange everything's position so the tank unit gets through. So it moves up, and then it moves on to the square, and then it moves on through, and this character has to get out of the way. And you notice this is not fast. And that's quite realistic. If you have something, there is a counter, unit counter known as a block, which is something you pre in place. The block blocks the road, and on the time scale of the game, you're stuck. Um, <clears throat> there are a few more minor pieces of movement. Uh, there is a rules, what appears to be a rules bug. One of those questions deals with it. Suppose you want to move artillery with a combat factor of zero. <coughs> How do you do this? Well, you move the trucks onto the square with the artillery, and you spend a turn loading it or attaching it. You can then move. At the start of the next turn, you unload it. So we're now to turn three. On turn four, the artillery gets to shoot again. Given that Panzerblitz games run f ten or so turns, you aren't going to be doing a lot of displacement because if you do, the weapons will spend all of their time on trucks and none of their time shooting. <coughs> Um, however, it is a possible rule, but there's a feature. There's a stacking limit. If you're the Russian, it's two. If you're the German, it's three. So here are two Russian artillery units stacked on the same square. We would like to use trucks to move them. You can't. It's, in order to do that, the first thing you would have to do is to move the truck on top of the square, and you're at the stacking limit, you can't do that move. Now, a reasonable statement is, no, this isn't the way the world works, and you could fix the rules in some manner to accommodate this. So you could say a truck may move on top and load, and the stacking limit is applied afterwards. It had better be applied afterwards <coughs> because the truck is sitting there. And so you can tune rules to get things to work. But sometimes, specific, especially, this was a radically novel game. Most of those rules are almost unique. Not quite. You overlook things or you need to word things differently. 
I say almost unique because, of course, this is the remake of Tactical Game 3, and there was the precursor game, Don Greenwood's Company Commanders. I see, however, I am out of time, so we will stop. Class is dismissed.